It's good to see you here today. I hope you can trust that you've had an awesome week this week. And it's been a very eventful and busy week this week. Uh, our kids are back from camp. They've had a really great time. We'll get to hear about them tonight and the, what the uh, activities they've had. We're going to have our children's church. Children's church. We're going to have our children's camp report tonight. But I also want to share with you tonight the Southern Baptist Convention that we attended. It's probably one of the most active in my lifetime that I've been to. And uh, there's a lot of new changes on the horizon. And especially if you're a lady, you would want to come tonight and hear what I have to say. Um, and it's not in a bad way. Uh, it's a good, good thing. Um, but there's been a major move in the convention this time in T T Dallas, Texas, where we were at. So we'll do that, and then we'll turn over to the children, and they'll take off with it and go. I um, also would like to let you know the Committee on Committees will meet briefly at the front of the sanctuary after the morning worship service this morning. And so I wanted to let you know about that. We have other activities going on in the life of our church. We encourage you to, to get your bulletin and read them. We're not going to go over all of them. Uh, but the deacon election will be Sunday, August 5th, so don't forget about that. And uh, Mr. Howard will be going deacon emeritus status. And so we'll have that election on Sunday morning, August the 5th. Um, also, I'd like to let you know about it's time for the nominating committee to begin their work as well. They have been, and so pray for them. There's a very important announcement in, uh, in the bulletin, if you would. Please, uh, please read that. Um, I wanted to know also stuff the bus. We're trying to help junior auxiliaries, trying to help. Um, and so there's a very important announcement about helping out with school supplies. And if you'd like to do that, please look in your bulletin. You'll see that. I wanted to let you know we have some cons prayer concerns this morning. Sybil Holman, also Ms. Dale Mullins, Jesse Ray Vince, that's Jason's dad, and uh, my mother, Mary Parker, of which she's in the hospital, have, has been for about five days. Uh, and she has double pneumonia pneumonia in both lungs so if you would be in prayer for her um, as we try to as she has a lot of tests going to be performed this week and try to find out other problems she has um, we had 173 total present today with 15 on the phone ministry with nine visitors but a total of 173 and so a lot of folks are traveling so we need to remember but also if you would please remember in prayer um, Sonny as uh, he desperately needs our prayers and um, as he is still in the hospital, and so he prayed for Kathy and all the family as well. Um, we uh, ask if you would to bow for a word of prayer. We want to pray for these. Let us pray. Lord, sometimes we are just at a loss of words of what to pray for and what to say. But Lord, you know the healing that needs to happen. Well, Sonny, we pray for him today. We lift him up in prayer to you, and Lord, we also rejoice that Miss Sybil has, Lord, that you are, have been able to help her navigate through rough waters, and Lord, that you've done a work in her life. We also pray for those that are at home, or some of our church family are healing and trying to get better. We just pray for them. Lord, thank you for bringing our children back to us uh, safely from camp. We pray also for all the other activities we have so many lord that we have with our youth and our children and uh, we know that it's going to be a, a a ride from here to the end of the summer and so as they go to youth camp we pray for that uh, lord there's some folks that are not here today they're on the road traveling we pray for them please bring them back safely to us um, we just pray god for the life of our church and father we just pray that you would help us lord as a, your people that we would rejoice thank you again for your blessings and God we just ask now that you would permeate this place God we just Lord seek you this morning and we want to just sense your presence and feel your presence and see you move and move upon hearts Lord we are asking for the presence of the Holy Spirit to, to be made known in this place in this place today in Jesus name Amen if you will have Brother Eric out morning let's stand together the choir's going to sing for a minute i want you to take a take some time and greet each other this morning
All the children also, this is time for you to go to the children's church this morning. sing together. We declare your majesty. the choir this morning. If you have an order of service, you just will go throw it down on the seat because we're not doing anything by that, okay? Alright? We're going to sing our offertory hymn, hymn number 590 next. Give us clean hands. 590. Spirit, come make us humble. We turn our eyes from evil things. Oh Lord, we cast down our idols. Give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls. Generation that seeks 
Thank you, ladies. As we continue, we'll sing 623, 154, and hymn number 50. You can remain seated. 623, 154, and hymn number 50.
from the highest of heights to the depths of the sea. Creation dream me. From the colors of fall to the fragrance of spring, every creature unique in the song that it sings, all exclaiming, indescribable, uncontainable, you place the stars in the sky and you know them by name. You are amazing, God. All powerful, untamable, all struck, we fall to our knees and we humbly proclaim. You are amazing, God. Who has told every lightning bolt where? and go or seen heavenly storehouses laden with snow who imagine the sun and give source to its light yet conceals it to bring us the coolness of night None can fathom, indescribable, uncontainable. You place the stars in the sky and you know them by name. You are amazing God. All powerful, untamable, awestruck, we fall to our knees as we
Thank you, Brother Eric and Choir. That was, I really like that. That's, I could just see Elvis singing that song. Remind me of one of his songs that he used to sing. I'm a huge Elvis fan. I like Elvis a lot. Well, have you ever felt like you have uh, lost a cutting edge? I know when you start to have a eat a steak, you want to make sure your knife is sharp. And if you're a butcher, you want to make sure that your knife is sharp. You can't do a whole lot, you're going to get cut with the dull knife. Sometimes in our Christian walk, we may not become as sharp as we once was. And today we're going to go back in the Old Testament as Kings, in 2 Kings 6, chapter verses 1 through 7. And we're going to look at an axe head, an axe head, in, uh, in 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. I'd like to thank you for being here today. I really do appreciate your faithfulness. Before I start today, I, 29 years of biscuits is a pretty good many years. That's Brendan and I have been married 29 years today. So that's a long time, and so we're, we, uh, I'd like to say happy anniversary to my wife, and uh, hadn't been all black and white for 29 years, but it has been some good times and some tough times, times where that we had to depend on the Lord, just like I guess y'all had to in times, and, and um, times where that we didn't know if child was going to make it into the world or not, come close uh, to losing Joshua, and uh, just looking back on a lot of things like that, and also uh, even Haley too, one time uh, before she was born, so um, so God has blessed us in a lot of ways, and we give him the glory and the honor, and I take a page out of Mr. Howard's book that says, keep the romance in it, and so that's what he always says, and I think that is so, so true. Um, an older man told me one time, so you ought to date. You're, you never stop dating your wife, and uh, that's what he said. Regardless of how many years you've been married, you need to have a time to where that you all, if it's nothing but going to McDonald's or getting a Big Mac or whatever, you need to have a time to where it's just you are interested in what she has to say and, uh, and vice versa. So anyway, uh, it's worked pretty good. And um, so anyway, we are thankful uh, for all of these years. It's been great ride and hopefully we'll have a lot more for sure chapter 6 and verses 1 through 7 it's the axe head recovered it says now the sons of the prophets said to Elisha behold now the place before you we are living in is limited for us please let us go to the Jordan and each of us take from there a beam and let us make a place there for ourselves where we may live. And so, notice what it says. So he said, go there. One said, please be willing to go with your servants. And he answered, I shall go. And so he went with them. And when they came to the Jordan, they cut down trees. But as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water. And he cried out and said, Alas, my master, for it was borrowed. Then the man of God said, Where did it fall? And when he showed him the place, he cut off a stick and threw it in there and made the iron flow. And he said, Take it up for yourself. So he put out his hand and he took it. Would you bow with me? Father, I pray you'd bless the reading of your word. Lord, I just pray that you would, uh, God, just today as we think about what we're looking at today, Lord, help it to be real to us. Lord, help us to, Lord, we just, we can't pump flesh up and make it happen. Lord, it's going to have to be you. Lord, it's going to have to be you. And Lord, today as we look at this passage, I pray that you would just let these words lift off the pages and into our heart. God, that it would be very real to us.
Father, help us, Lord, to clear our minds and our hearts. Lord, that we'd sit at your feet for these next few minutes and that we would learn from you. In Christ's name, amen. Well, there was this fellow that had a parachute. He decided he wanted to go up in the plane and jump out, and so he jumps out of this airplane with this parachute. Well, the parachute apparently was not folded right. It was, uh, I talked to Mr. Bill Gingell. He used to jump out of planes, and he taught me a little bit about parachuting and things like that. You know, that's what he had actually had done in the military. And so this fellow, he jumped out of this airplane, and with his parachute, it did not open. And I cannot imagine jumping out of an airplane and your parachute won't open. And so he's headed for the ground, and all of a sudden he meets a man that's shooting up toward him. And he hollers at the guy and he says, do you know anything about parachutes? And the man says, no, but do you know anything about gas stoves? Thank you for laughing. Apparently one had a problem getting blown up with gas stoves and the other one had a problem folding his parachute right. So. But I'd like to share with you a message today entitled, I've Lost That Cutting Edge. Do you ever feel like you have lost that cutting edge. We don't like to admit it, but we may feel that way. You know, you're not hitting on all eight cylinders. You just can't seemingly get it together. You seem like you're swimming in mud or running in, uh, in tar. And I want to share with you this morning some stories that are absolutely true. They actually happen. And I believe that you'll agree with me this morning that there's people that who've lost that cutting edge. I know in my life I have. There's times in your life that you will too. There was an Illinois man, he was pretending to have a gun. And remember all these stories are true. And he kidnapped a motorist and he forced him to drive to two different automated teller machines. And the kidnapper proceeded to withdraw money, but it was from his own account. So we'll figure that one. There was a man that walked into a Topeka, Kansas quick stop and he asked for every bit of the money that was inside the cash register. And apparently, he thought that it was just not enough money that was coming out of the cash register when he was holding it up. And so he tied up the store clerk, and he worked the counter himself for three hours until the police showed up and arrested him. In Los Angeles, California, the police there, they, they had good luck with a robbery suspect. He just couldn't control himself in the lineup. You know what a lineup is, don't you? Lineup when folks stand there, they, the person that thinks, I think that's the man there. You know, and they'll pick a person out that they think is the right one that committed the crime. And when the the, there was the detectives there, they asked each one of those men in that lineup, I want you to repeat the words, give me all your money or I'll shoot. Well, the man shouted out, that's not what I said. Some people's elevator don't go all the way to the top. The man spoke frantically into the telephone. He was scared to death and he said, my wife's pregnant, and she's in contractions, and, and she's two minutes apart. And the doctor said, is this her first child? The man shouted, no, you idiot, this is her husband. <laughs> in Modesto, California, Stephen Richard King, he was arrested for trying to hold up a bank. And it was the Bank of America, and this guy didn't have a weapon. And so he used his thumb to simulate a gun. He put it in his pocket. And he used that to simulate, but what he had actually done in the middle of this, he failed to keep his hand on the inside of his pocket. And they realized, hey, he didn't have a gun. Some time ago, in California, it was Lake I Isabella, and uh, it's located on the, the high desert, and it's on the east side of Bakersfield, California. Uh, there were some folks there. They were excited. They had a brand new boat. They went out boating, and man, but they had a problem. Uh, no matter how hard they tried, they just could not get that brand new 22-foot boat going and moving. And so it was very sluggish, and it just would not maneuver. And they couldn't figure out what was going on. So they puttered around until they got to this marina. And after about an hour trying to do so, uh, they finally got there. And somebody could tell that something was wrong. And so they checked the boat up and down, inside out, every way you could imagine, trying to figure out what was wrong with it. And the engine was fine, and the outdrive went up and down, and the prop was the correct size and pitch, and 
And, and so one of the guys at the marina decided, he said, you know what? He said, I need to check underneath. So he jumped into the water to check underneath, and he came back up, and he was choking on water because he was laughing so loud. And you know, remember, this is true now. It really happened. Under the boat, they still had the trailer strapped securely to the boat. Now, that's bad. I would have... I believe that you would agree that those people definitely had lost their cutting edge. Some athletes feel like they have lost their cutting edge in golf and such as Tiger Woods and different ones. And so we're going to study today a very interesting story that deals with that very problem of losing your cutting edge. I'm going to ask if you would just put all the things that you have in your mind aside for just a few minutes. And if you will focus in on what this is trying to say. We'll have time and enough for all those things that we got we have to do a little bit later on in the day. And so as we look here, the prophet Elijah, he had a seminary in which he was obviously the head of the seminary, training school. You know what a seminary is. It's a training school. And so he was president of the school, and the school was just growing by leaps and bounds here, and it was outgrowing itself, and so they needed a new dormitory, apparently. And so they determined, we're going to go out, we're going to build a bigger dormitory, we're going to build bigger facilities, and we're going to be able to hold all of these students that attend. And one young man goes out to work, and while he's busy, he's chopping trees. His axe head, you know what an axe head is? You know what an axe is? Well, there's, and you have a double bit and single bit axe. And so he has an axe, it has that metal piece that cuts the wood on it, and he is working very hard, and, and all of a sudden that axe head comes loose and it flies into water. I've had axe head come off a double bit axe before, and it flew across the ground when we was trying to cut wood, getting ready for winter. And, and so this axe head, it just flies into the water. And so what he does, he runs and he tells Elisha. And Elisha cuts down a stick, he throws it into the water, and miraculously the axe head, it's metal, but it floats. And, and so he recovers the axe head and the work resumes. And so that's a very unusual story, but here it is in this passage of Scripture. And it's very relevant to where many of us are living at today. I find myself in this story as well. One of the most helpful things about the Bible and one of the things that makes the reading of God's Word so relevant is the problems of life that we face today. And, and so we find reflected in many of these stories here the, the experiences of our own life. And that's exactly what you're going to find out this morning in this story because we see here there are three secrets on what to do when you've lost. Three things that we need to do when we've lost a cutting edge. So if you're in this category today and you've lost that cutting edge, especially with your relationship with the Lord, please pay attention to me today. Number one, we need to rekindle our passion for labor. I'm going to walk you through these passages here. Verse 1, notice it says that the sons of the prophet said to Elisha, See now the place where we dwell with you is too small for us. School. They weren't standing still. They was growing. They was increasing enrollment. And they were adding students. And they were lengthening their cords. And they were strengthening their stakes. And, and so remember this. Anything that moves causes friction. And anything that does not move is dead. Any area of life, we find that where you find growth, there's going to always be a problem. A kid can grow. He outgrows his britches. You have to go get him some more get her some more and so as you grow you've got to buy more clothes you have a family you grow you have to have enough room for everybody to sit you have to buy a different car you have to buy more food especially if you have boys in your house uh, as churches grow there's a, a need for new buildings there's a need for a new parking lot there's a need for more land in some churches because they're landlocked and there, there's this need for more staff and but this was a school that was willing to pay the price and and, and put you, you, they was going to put in the hours and sacrifice whatever it took for them to grow that's what they was going to do and I would have loved this school because they were growing and they were glowing and they were going they were moving onward and upward and outward for the glory of God so they was moving and one of the ways to deal with losing your cutting edge is to stay productive you become unproductive Life can be miserable. Let me ask some of you that deal with an axe. If you have an axe head and you lay it outside on that stump until another month passes, then 
and you come back, what are you going to find as far as the way that axe head looks? Huh? It's going to be rusty. It hadn't been moving. It hadn't been productive. It hadn't been doing anything. So what are you going to do to try to make that rust disappear? How do you make that rust disappear off that axe? Again, sometimes you need to sharpen it. You use that axe and get dull, but also you need to sharpen it. And so we need to stay productive. Everybody, I don't know about everybody, but most folks want to stay productive. There was a psychologist at Stanford University who tried to show that, that we live for productive results, and it's what we call fruit. What if you continuously worked and you never, ever witnessed any fruit from what you're doing? How would that get? How would that get for you if you never witnessed any fruit? And so this researcher here, he hired a man. He was a logger. And he said to him, he said, I'm going to pay you double what you get paid in the logging camp. He said, I, what I want you to do is I want you to take the blunt end of the axe that I'm going to give you, and I just want you to pound on this log all day long. Not the sharp end, but the blunt end, okay? You never have to cut one piece of wood. I want you to just go and do that. And so he took that, the end of that blunt end, and he, and he hit it as hard as he could as if he was logging. And this man worked for half a day and real diligently, and he was getting double the pay. And he came back to him and he said, I can't do this anymore. Psychologist, he said, why'd you quit? And the logger said, because every time I move an ax, I have to see the chips fly. And if I don't see the chips fly, then it's no fun to me. And I'm convinced that there's a lot of people in church who get no joy out of church. They have no joy in our Christian life because they're using the wrong end of the axe and there's no chips flying. We don't see any results. They're producing the fruit. And they're not being productive for the kingdom and therefore their joy is gone. But you see, this school here was prospering and, and, and the hand of God was on this school. And I'm telling you what, it's something when you have the hand of God upon you. I've been there when it was not. But the hand of God was on this school and, and with anything, when it prospers, one of two spirits will always take over when something is prospering. Either the spirit of satisfaction or the spirit of sacrifice. If you have the spirit of satisfaction that takes over, what happens eventually to the person or to the entity? You get complacent. You get complacent. You get satisfied. You see, it's it's easy to, to say at a, at a certain point we're big enough or we don't need to, to spend anymore or we don't need to build any more buildings or we have conquered all the horizons. We don't need to try to, to see any further or we've done all of that or we've done it. I've been there. I've worn that hat. I've done that. You may say to yourself, well, I know they had a passion for what they were doing, but after all, they were learning about God. It was a seminary. Listen fully. Every Christian works for God. Whether you work at a seminary, whether you work at a steakhouse, you serve the Lord. You ought to be able to serve the Lord with gladness. There's a song that we sing, serve the Lord with gladness. You see, serving God is totally different from serving anyone else. The Bible says in Psalm 100 and verse 2, it says, serve the Lord with gladness. But sometimes your gladness can be pulled from you because we've lost that cutting edge. I'll tell you why. In Acts 17, 25, it says, God is not served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. We serve God because we don't bear the burden of meeting his needs. We rejoice in service where he meets our needs. We ought to have a passion for labor, and it'll keep you having that cutting edge. We need to be able to have that cutting edge. Number two, you need to realize your purpose in You don't ever remember anything else about me. I want you to remember that you were asked this question. And I hope and pray you'll answer it when you die. What is my purpose in life? Have you
Have you realized your purpose in life? Please let us go to the Jordan and let every man take a beam from there and let us make there a place where we may dwell. Now, so he answered, he said, go in verse number two. And they wanted to make sure that their plan was from the Lord and of the Lord. You see, Elisha, the man of God, was representative of God himself, and they were, they were speaking to God's prophet, trying to get God's approval for what they were doing because they understood something that you and I need to understand, and that is this. God not only wants his work to be done in his might, but he wants it done with his method. There's a way that God wants things done. We're not only to do what God wants, but we're supposed to do it the way God wants us to do it. We think that we, and I tell you, I'm a fixer. We, we can figure things out, and we want to, and we thought we had it figured out. Sometimes that's not what God wants. The Word of God contains some powerful promises as to what He'll do for us if we'll seek His plan, and not our own plans. First of all, He's promised His counsel. If you're seeking God's plans, and if you're seeking God's heart, and you're seeking God's will, you will find that God will give you the direction that you need. Counsel. It says in Proverbs 19, 21, it says, There are many plans in a man's heart, but nevertheless the Lord's counsel, that will stand. And I'm telling you, God will give you the book that you need to, to read the plan of instruction. And when you seek the plan of God, you'll also get God's control. Notice in Proverbs 16, 6, it says, Commit your works to the Lord and your thoughts will be established. Commit those works to the Lord. Notice the difference between works and plans. If you'll commit what you're going to do for God, God will establish the way that you're supposed to do it. And then finally, you'll get God's confirmation. In Proverbs 21, 31, it says, The horse is prepared for the day of battle, but deliverance is of the Lord. The battle's the Lord. You know, we can plan, you can scheme, you can organize, you can agonize, you can pull a string, you can talk to a friend, all of that kind of stuff. But victory in any vester rests with the Lord. It rests with the Lord. And verse 3, then one said, please consent to go with your servants. And he answered, I will go. They said, would you please go with us? Could you please go with us? And notice, they not only wanted his plan, but they also wanted his presence. I don't know about you, but I don't want to go anywhere without the presence of the Lord. They wanted God to be a part of what they were doing. You see, we've not been put here on this earth just to work for God, but we've been put here to work with God. And as we work for God, God works with us, and we work through God, and God works in us. That's the way God works. His work is being done. And I believe that old Elisha, I firmly believe, he said to him, I will go not. If he had said that, they would stay behind. They were saying to Elijah, "We're going to work for you, but we're not. We're going to work. We're not going to work without you." What mattered to them was what should matter to you. That is the presence of God in all that you do. And that leads to a great lesson. You ought to be able to take God with you everywhere you go. Say to him, Lord, I, I'm, I'm your servant. Lord, I'm going to go. And if he says, I won't go, then we should go. Verse 4, so he went with them, and they came to the Jordan, and they cut down trees. Now, I want you to follow this progression here. God's work is to be done with God's presence. It's to be done according to God's plan. And it has to be done through God's people. And God has no hands but ours. He has no feet. Whenever anything's done for the glory of God, God's people are at work. And I want you to remember this in everything that you do. You cannot do God's work without him. You cannot do God's work without him. And he will not do his work without you. God's work takes all of us. Working together. Individually. Takes all of us. Uh, if we want to have a Bible study, if we want to build a great Bible study, we're going to have to have somebody to teach it. You know, you, you can have a choir would have singers, but your leader can't do it by himself. Some can teach, some can sing, some can usher, some can, but we all can serve somehow. Whatever you can do, by the grace of God, you should do it. That's the way it works. You know, we do our part, he does his part, and God gets the glory. And, he gets, and, and we get a big blessing out of it. So this is your purpose in life. Find out what God wants you then you need to do it with all of your mind. 
You see, God's left you here for a reason. You're just not here taking up air and taking up space. You have been left here for a reason. Knowing that he does it through you for his glory. When you do that, you're going to be fine. And then number three, and this is Recover your power from the Lord. Verse number five. But as one was cutting down a tree, that the iron axe head fell off into the water, and he cried out and he said, Alas, Master, for it was large. And I want you to notice here this man, he lost his axe head while he was there working. He wasn't lazy, he wasn't sleeping, he wasn't dozing off. He was working hard. And and and, and matter of fact, he had to be chopping very hard for that axe head to fly off. Because a lot of times it takes a lot of pressure to pull that thing off. And the man, he had a mind to work. He was busy for God. He was doing what he was supposed to be doing. He didn't lose his power by lying down. He lost it by standing up. And, and so that was a, a part of the problem. This man was diligent in his work, but he was negligent in his watch. The man had gotten so busy chopping the tree that he had neglected to check the axe. That's application. You know, you can get so busy doing things for God that you can neglect to spend time with God. I've done that before. When you do, when you do that, you can mark it down that you're, you're going to lose a cutting edge. Ecclesiastes 10.10 10 says that if an axe is dull and one does not sharpen the edge, then he must use more strength but wisdom brings it sound. There was two pastors some years ago that was talked to, both of them were in more faith. And we've had that happen very recently in our Southern Baptist Convention. It's been very disturbing. You've read about it in the Baptist record and so forth. But years ago, there were these two different ministers that had uh, committed some moral sins. And they had to leave the ministry. They lost their dignity. They lost the integrity they had. And they almost lost their family. And they was asked one question. And the one question they were asked is that when this happened, when this happened, what you know? Were you spending time in the Word of God? Were you spending time with the Lord? And both of those men said, no, I was not. And it's a fact that more spiritual breakdown can be traced back to a neglected devotional life than any other area. Notice something else about this axe head. It was a borrowed axe head. This man didn't have an axe head of his own. Or he would have not borrowed one. So do you know why the story specifically tells us that it was borrowed? Why does it tell us that? The axe head represents the power of God. You see, you don't do God's work on borrowed power. Let that sink in for just a second. If you ever use anything that belongs to somebody else, you either borrowed it or you stole it. As you well know, the Bible says that you can steal God's time. That's possible. But there's one thing that you and I, we cannot steal from God. You can't buy from God. It's something that can only you can borrow from God. And that is the power of God. The same God that loans you the power, the same God that can call for it at any time that you please it. Rush Limbaugh, Limbaugh. He always had a statement. And he said, talent on, uh, talent on loan for, from God. That's a pretty good statement. Everything that you and I have is on loan for God, everything. You have the, the title deed to nothing. The time that you have, the talents that you have, your treasure, all of it, God has loaned that to you, and God can call that any time that he wants. But that raises the question. If you've lost the cutting edge, how are you supposed to? Verse 6 says, And the man of God said, Where did it fall? And he showed him the place. What I'm about to share with you is very important. This is the key. I feel like at least one person in this place, this is hitting you right between the eyes. If you've lost that cutting edge, you've got to go back where you lost it place of recovery is always the place of departure. Have you ever lost your wallet? Have you ever lost your car keys? 
you let somebody else know about it, what's the first question they ask you? What is it? Where do you remember the last place you went? I find more and more these days my wife has to ask me that question. And we think, well, you know, that might be a dumb question. But you know, that's exactly the right question. Because you always find something exactly where you lost it. Heard about a little five-year-old boy. He fell out of bed. He hit the floor and he cried out in a loud voice. And he woke up. The whole family, folks, was scared in the, in the house. And his mama came and running in the room. She said, honey, what happened? She picked him up off the floor. He was crying. He was upset. She tucked him back under the covers and she asked the obvious question. She said, honey, why did you fall out of bed? And he was sobbing. He couldn't get his breath. Between those breaths, he said, well, I guess I, I went to sleep too close to where I got in. Wherever you lose something is where you're going to find it. If you've lost that cutting edge with God, there's some questions that I want to ask you right now. you lose your power with God and your cutting edge and the fast flowing river of worlds. If you have, you need to get out of the world. You need to get back where you need to be. That's what God is. Excuse me. Number two, did you lose your power with God and your cutting edge and the current of your sin? When you put self last, God and others sack it, then you're going to recover that cutting edge. Sometimes we get prideful. And sometimes if it won't, how is it going to affect us? How is it going to affect me? How am I going to benefit out of this? Did you lose your power with God and that cutting edge and the mud of impurity and iniquity? Simply put, there's some things you're doing in your life that has caused you you repent of your sin and you determine to get right with God, you're going to find that you will you'll regain that cutting edge with the Lord. Go back and you need to ask yourself the question Have I neglected the Word of God? Have I neglected talking with God on a daily basis? Is there a sin an unconfessed that you are harboring in your life. Maybe there's something that is unforgiven and it's blocking your way to God. If any of these things are true, you know exactly where you can find the cutting edge. In verses 6 and 7, so he cut off a stick, threw it, threw it there, and he made the iron float. And therefore he said, pick it up for yourself. So he reached out his hand. I, I don't know what all of that means, but I do know this. Number one, it happens exactly the way the Bible says it happened. So I believe the stick here is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know the Bible calls Jesus the righteous branch. It calls him the branch of David, and I believe that Elisha cut off that stick and threw it in the river, and he gave life to that axe head, and the axe head flowed. When Jesus was on the cross, and he was crucified, he was cast into that river of death. He gave us life so that we may conquer the river of death and live forever. I want you to notice what happened here this, to this young man. When he found this lost axe head, he took it for himself and he, and he put it back on the handle. When you confess your sin to God and when you confess that you are powerless without him, and you cry out, your need for him. And then by faith, you, you claim again the power of his Holy Spirit. You'll get back that cutting edge. And it's nothing. It feels like you come home. I want you to look carefully what he did with it. When he, when he took the axe in, he put it back on. And then he went back to work. You cannot do God's work without God's power. And I would never want to do that. I never want to preach or do anything without God's power. But God's power is given to do 
through God's work. God's power is not for show. God's power is for service. God is, is not looking for show horses. God is looking for some work horses. You'll never have power from God until you're committed to do the work of God. And if you're not committed to do the work of God, you can't expect God's power to be your life. When you rekindle your passion for labor, and you realize your purpose in life, and you recover your power from the Lord, you will find without even realizing that you've regained that cutting edge. Do you need to regain your cutting edge? You can do that starting right now. I've simply laid out some ways to do that. I never want to get in a pulpit. I never want to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with anybody. I never want to attempt to go on a mission trip. I never want to attempt to do anything without the power of God. Father, this story has been very difficult to understand. Lord, we know you, Jesus. Not just to learn, but to help us to get back where we need to be. Lord, for some of us, there's some of us that hadn't been used in a while. Not too sharp. So, God, we can work ourselves to death. Doing things for God. I pray today, Lord, right now, God, with all of my heart, if there's just one person in this place, if they are honest with themselves, and they know in their heart they need to regain that cutting edge, Father, I pray that the things that have been shared with them today would sink deep in their heart. refreshing new faith. Lord, let us live to always please you, but help us to never neglect you through our time and devotion and drawing close. Father, we, we're going to have an invitation, and it can be just another, another day, another 